so thanks everybody for joining. Um, and there's probably going to be more that just kind of trickle in as we get moving here. Um, so my name is Cameron Cedar. I've been with SUSE for 15 plus years, uh, supporting uh, SUSE strategic opportunities and a lot of their premium customers over the years. Um, so hopefully I can use some of my experience uh, and explain to you some of what we're doing here at SUSE um, around multi-cloud, uh, multi-cluster management and uh, what that really means to us. Uh, and hopefully this is uh, something that is a topic that is top of your mind as well. Um, again, this is going back, this is the Kubernetes infrastructure that I'm running in this demonstration environment. Uh, it's called CAS platform or containers of service platform. Um, so again, uh, three master nodes, three worker nodes for the cluster. Um, and then on top of that, uh, the infrastructure for SUSE cloud application platform, which is a platform as a service running on top of Kubernetes. Um, I was just talking about the Irene and Quarks projects that allow us uh, to run this Cloud Foundry framework on top of Kubernetes. Um, so those provide the Kubernetes operator and the scheduling engine uh, to execute applications running on top of Kubernetes for Cloud Foundry. Um, and then I was explaining this particular diagram just last uh, that explains all of the, uh, the containers uh, that are part of the Cloud application platform. Um, providing the runtime, uh, the routing and access API and management infrastructure, um, logging and various types of storage attachment and services attachment to your applications. On top of that, I wanted to kind of break out a little bit and, and speak just a little bit about uh, workflows. Uh, workflows when it comes to DevOps uh, more importantly, CI, CD pipelines, um, because I think it plays a big role when you have a Kubernetes cluster up and running. Um, if you're doing de any type of development, you are also setting up a CI, CD pipeline. And this is what, uh, you know, a platform as a service is famous for providing, is a, an opinionated view of a workflow. Um, and here's a typical workflow, you know, if you were to typically set this up on top of a Kubernetes cluster, um, you will more than likely use some sort of Jenkins or a tool that provides some type of automation. And I'll get to some of those more integrated tools and what those are. Um, but you going from your source code to your build environment, Jenkins is going to allow you to orchestrate that whole process uh, for your workflow. So when you're building out uh, your application as a container and putting the source code and pairing that up with uh, either a build pack uh, or a container that has a specialized build environment uh, for you to build your source code in and then output a Docker container of sorts uh, into a registry, which can be launched or published into production on top of Kubernetes. All this stuff is going to be automated and orchestrated uh, with the use of Jenkins. And then of course, there's many other tools which you can choose from, from the CNCF foundation landscape to plug into this. So it can get, you know, <laughs> quite large. Um, there's lots of maintenance that goes on here when you're, when you are maintaining workflow, um, because there are several different pieces and parts, uh, to this particular workflow, but it's all part of the development process. And, uh, this is, uh, not much different than, uh, you know, any Java development, uh, from times past, which still happen today. Um, we've, you know, gone through the process of simplifying Java development and, you know, putting Java into war files and, and launching those and, and, you know, making it easy. Um, not much different, right? We're just doing this with more languages now and uh, creating these workflows to handle multiple languages. But 
once you add a platform as a service to this infrastructure, it becomes a little bit more opinionated. Um, you have uh, this extended workflow um, that connects directly into this, what we call a black box, um, because it's doing some magic behind the scenes that you really don't see what's going on or you don't really understand or know what's going on, uh, maybe from an operator perspective. Uh, from a developer, you expect the platform to do as you tell it to do um, and uh, just spit out my application to run. Um, and that's what you wanted to do with this black box. <clears throat> Inside this black box on a typical platform as a service, <laughs> there's lots of things going on. Um, for Cloud Foundry, um, this is a typical, you know, workflow of what's going on inside of um, KubeCF or Kubernetes Cloud Foundry. And uh, as you can see, there is lots of things going on. Um, when you actually are building the uh, source code into a container, um, doing some some QA testing of the container and then launching that container, getting it ready, pairing it up with uh, your, um, your build pack with the right language, uh, maybe connecting it to a, a service that's part of the, uh, um, part of the application uh, or connecting it to um, you know, multiple services, right? You could have applications that are much larger in size than you know single uh, or multiple pods on Kubernetes. You know the way that Kubernetes sets things up today is uh, they're not necessarily an application form. Um, there's multiple pods, and multiple pods can form a single application. And any one pod could have you know a dozen to maybe one container running in it. Um, and so a, a single application um, in, you know, in application speak, um, it could be multiple pods. And one application could consist of 15 to 50 different containers all working together for a single application. Um, and so in the context of deploying applications and managing applications, um, in a platform as a service. That's why this becomes very, very important because you can manage things uh, much more efficiently and easier from an application point of view. And some of these more opinionated uh, integration points from a CI CD system that are much more native to Kubernetes are things like Tekton. Um, Drone or Argo, Jenkins X is extremely popular. Uh, these, all, all these platforms that you see here provide a much more native uh, CI CD um, pipeline uh, that runs directly on Kubernetes. Um, and you don't have to make any guesswork about what other things might get connected to it, like Jenkins and other things. Um, it has its own built-in orchestration and automation uh, that is provided. Well, what if I want to um, take these and plug that directly into a platform as a service? And this is where SUSE is spending uh, some time working on um, how this all works and is fit together. Um, we're working on some deeper integration here. Um, between CI CD platforms and platform as a service and how they can complement each other. Um, so whether it's using Tekton, whether it's using Jenkins X for your build test and packaging, um, more than likely you'll want to uh, send that over to Cloud Foundry to package that up as an application and, and uh, deliver that on top of uh, your Kubernetes infrastructure. And it typically would work in conjunction with a private registry that you might have in your environment, such as Harbor that comes with, uh, with SUSE uh, cloud application platform, um, and also integrating other uh, additions there uh, that might provide any type of monitoring, logging, those types of things that are required for uh, managing 
an application uh, with multiple pods and containers all together. Um, so SUSE is spending a lot of time doing this type of work and figuring out what the, the best or opinionated view might be out there. Um, and more than likely plugging in directly to, to Cloud Foundry uh, with your own opinionated view, whether it's Tekton or Jenkins X or something you've already built, um, that's fine. Um, you can plug those in uh, directly to Cloud Foundry uh, today. So also building out a richer management experience when it comes to uh, managing both Kubernetes, the underlying layer, and also the platform on top. Uh, whether that's Cloud Foundry and all of the other uh, workflow pieces that we just talked about. Um, you know, SUSE is working on building out a better management experience using uh, what's called the Stratos console, which comes with both our container as a service platform and our cloud application platform. And for Kubernetes, uh, we've been able to have the ability to connect up to multiple Kubernetes endpoints. Uh, so you could be managing one cluster or you can be managing five or more clusters from a single Stratos um, management platform. And we can authenticate to you know, Azure, AWS, Google, um, SUSE CAS platform and other Kubernetes distributions as well. <clears throat> so the view here is really aimed at trying to best manage a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it also has an embedded Kubernetes dashboard, so it comes directly from the upstream, which you can install directly using the Stratos console itself. And it does that by uh, utilizing the Helm chart capabilities within Stratos. Another addition is Prometheus and Grafana for uh, the metrics gathering throughout the entire cluster, um, which it actually will run on all of your nodes um, and do all your metrics gathering, logging, um, and export all those logs into, um, into Cloud Foundry, both for Kubernetes and for the Cloud Foundry uh, that's running on top of uh, the Kubernetes infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> and all this, all the Stratos views that you see both in Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes, um, all those metrics uh, that are gathered there, um, those are all extended um, and connected with the, uh, the Prometheus metrics endpoint uh, that is set up uh, within Stratos. There's also Helm endpoints. So if you have Helm repositories that you like to use because it provides some very specific applications that you require in your environment, then feel free to add those as endpoints within the Stratos console. And you can um, browse, uh, you can browse the Helm chart repository at, like a marketplace. And by a click of a button, you can click install. Um, you can modify the values file uh, directly from the interface and you can click install and it will directly install that Helm chart uh, directly in the Stratos console. So it makes a nice marketplace um, for, uh, for application deployment right inside uh, the, uh, the console itself. <clears throat> and now I want to shift to showing you um, a little bit of a demonstration here. This here is the Stratos console. I'm just going to log in as administrator. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to increase the font just a little bit. Not too large. The first thing that I want to show you 
um, is the endpoints. And I just want to show you endpoints because, you know, you'll notice that in this particular setup, I've got multiple endpoints. In fact, I have, I've got Helm chart repositories. I've got a couple of those. Um, one's the Kubernetes charts.susa.com. I've also got a Helm chart repository for eclipse.org. So they have some Helm charts out there for the, uh, um, for Eclipse. Uh, like Eclipse Shea and some other things, uh, more specifically for um, managing their edge platforms. Um, and then we've got a couple of different uh, uh, SUSE uh, cloud application platform environments. I've got one that's uh, the, the uh, SUSE developer sandbox. If you're not familiar with that, um, I certainly urge you to go out to explore dot susa dot dev and uh, check out that URL um, and uh, you can get access to your own um, sandbox environment to do do your own development in I, I believe it gives you about 10 gigabytes of of memory it has some limited resources but it gives you a nice idea of how this system actually works uh, we also provide you with some sample applications you can play around with or you can develop your own, uh, put your own uh, Java code in there or whatever it is, Ruby, Python, whatever you like to program in, drop your own code in there and, and run it. Um, and see how you like the environment. Um, it's really powerful to use. Um, there's also a connection to the Kubernetes environment that's attached here uh, on susadojo.com. And then I also have Prometheus. I don't think Prometheus is working properly with this little um, warning sign there. Um, but not to worry, that's okay. Uh, we'll still be able to show you uh, some really cool stuff. Um, so going from endpoints and looking at the left-hand side, you'll see Helm. Uh, this will be populated once you have Helm repositories, uh, uh, Helm repository endpoints added. Um, and this is just a nice little view. Um, you can either do a list view or a grid view of the applications, um, but uh, you can search through these or you can filter them by name. Um, I could install a, a Harbor registry. Um, I could set up an Nginx ingress. Uh, controller. Um, of course, Prometheus is in, in here. We also have from SUSE our uh, Rook uh, Ceph deployment. So if you wanted to set up Ceph storage on your Kubernetes cluster uh, for a hyper-converged configuration of Ceph, uh, you could do, do that through this interface here. Kubernetes, once you have the uh, endpoint there, if you are looking at the list on the left-hand side, this is kind of a neat uh, view into your Kubernetes, your Kubernetes cluster. Although it doesn't give you everything from the summary page, it does give you, you know, some idea of how many resources you're using. Um, I've got 125 pods running in this particular cluster. Um, which isn't a lot in comparison to many production environments. You're going to see hundreds to thousands of pods deployed in production environments. But it also has the uh, advantage here of hitting configure. And if I didn't have the dashboard installed already, it would have an option here to install the dashboard. And it will basically grab that using the Helm chart. Um, but instead, since it's already installed, I can click View Dashboard and directly in the Stratus console, I can pull up the Kubernetes console. And this will give me some extended information about my Kubernetes cluster. I can view the services that are available and I can view them in many of the different namespaces, my Kubernetes system namespace, um, my Longhorn storage uh, namespace, um, 
I have my monitoring namespace. This is for Prometheus. And you can see where those endpoints, uh, you can see where the external endpoints are and I can open up a browser uh, to those endpoints directly. Um, and then I can open up my, my Prometheus using that. Um, the Kubernetes dashboard is really handy for system administrators to really manage Kubernetes, save you some, it'll save your fingers <laughs> from typing uh, a lot of the kube control commands um, that many of uh, the Kubernetes administrators get quite used to um, in the environment. Um, we at SUSE also have in our package repositories other tools like K9S. Um, which is also very handy as well, in addition to uh, this Kubernetes dashboard. But you can also visualize all your workloads as well and get a nice workload status view of all the pods that are running there and uh, get an understanding of, of, the, uh, of what the resources really are looking like. <clears throat> um, and then, of course, your cluster nodes in general. Um, here's all the six nodes that I have running in this particular cluster, the CPU utilization and the memory utilization across the board, um, all the namespaces I have created, um, storage classes that I have created. Um, so this is very valuable. Anything that you can um, query from a kube control command, you can pretty much see here in the Kubernetes dashboard. It doesn't have everything, however. Um, so anything that you want to do with, uh, um, you know, in, that revolves around any type of uh, security or service accounts, those types of things, um, those all have to be handled through a lot of the command line interfaces, um, secrets management. Um, you know, although you can view secrets here, uh, the creation and um, you know, the better use of, of that is all done through command line. Um, so that's powerful. I don't, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time with that. Um, another thing that, uh, that you'll notice here is Cloud Foundry. Um, now I can pick and choose what, uh, uh, what endpoint I want to connect to. Um, what's really powerful about this is that, that you get a, a really good idea of that I'm I'm able to, from a single pane of glass, uh, manage multi-cluster and multi-cloud. Um, these two in, uh, Kubernetes, or excuse me, Cloud Foundry environments uh, are ones on-prem, and this other one here, the, the SUSE dev environment, or the sandbox, um, is located in the Amazon cloud. Um, so I'm truly managing a multi-cloud environment using this console here today. Um, if I connect up to the sandbox, I can get more of a summary view of what's going on in this particular cluster. Um, but more importantly, I can understand what Cloud Foundry is all about uh, just from this view. Um, I actually have uh, build packs. So these will allow me to build um, Nginx, Java, Ruby. Um, I have many different languages that are supported here. I've got Go and PHP, Node.js. Um, so pick your favorite language. Um, I'm sure that we can build it out here. Even your .NET Core, if you uh, if you like to develop in .NET. Um, <clears throat> and then of course we've got routes. I do have a 12 factor application running. Um, I can take a look at um, the applications that are running in this environment. Um, you'll notice the one at the bottom here where it says 12 factor, or I can go to the very top on the left hand side and click applications. And this will give me an overall view of every one of my endpoints. So, in conjunction together, and I can do filters. So if I don't want to view all endpoints and all applications across all endpoints, then I can change that to just viewing the dev sandbox and it will show me all applications that are running in the, in the dev sandbox. Um, or I can look at 
my on-prem deployment and view the applications that are running there. Um, so it gives you a nice ability, ability to filter out and, and um, see multiple endpoints together uh, if you're managing uh, multi-cluster uh, or multi-cloud together in, in uh, the Stratos console. Um, so that scales pretty well um, as far as, it, as its uh, management goes. Um, let's take a look at an application because that's kind of the fun part about this is actually deploying applications and just seeing how easy it is to launch an application in this environment. Um, I'm going to look more specifically at the, uh, the dev sandbox. I'm going to look at this 12 factor application. And I picked this one because this actually uh, ties with a uh, Redis database. Um, there's nothing really that special with this particular application, um, but uh, it does bind itself to a Redis database. Now, if I want to see um, those services running, um, I can click on services on the left, and you'll notice I've got multiple services here. I've got a RabbitMQ, PostgreSQL, MariaDB, um, and Redis. What's really nice about uh, the services within Cloud Foundry is that you can create these services um, that are running on top of Kubernetes, um, but you can bind these services to your application so that uh, when you are writing your code, you can directly write that code to this common service API and get access to the service no matter if it's a, you know, some type of a SQL database or a messaging queue or Redis, uh, and there's many others that you can choose from. Um, so you notice that this Redis one actually has an application that's attached to it. And you can have more than one application attached to a service. Um, you could have a dozen or more, right? Um, you can scale this out quite large. But the application that's actually attached to this, I think this is actually, yeah, I could unbind it if I wanted to. Um, the application that's tied to this is the 12 factor application. <clears throat> and if I wanted to, I could completely restage or I could stop. Let's go ahead and just stop this application. It's now offline. Um, I can restage this application. Let's go ahead and restage it. What that will do is um, it will go through the complete build process of the application itself. Um, and uh, so let's go ahead and show that. Uh, it's actually started up the restaging. Um, let's see if it will show the staging process. Uh, maybe I'm not connected to the sandbox. There's our 12 factor. And yeah, so you can see in our staging here and through the log stream that uh, You'll notice through the log stream, it's doing our staging. It's actually running the install of these particular um, uh, libraries and things required to run this 12 factor application. And then it's going to actually um, create a container here. It's using the Diego cell um, in order to do, do some, uh, some testing of the application, um, destroying and creating that container. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, it's now 2.05 Eastern. We have about 10 minutes um, remaining. Yeah. So if you want to start yeah. the Q&A now, you certainly can. Or if you just like to continue the presentation, um, feel free. Yeah, um, we do have one raised hand in the audience. I'm not sure if this person has a question or if they were just um, one of the people nice enough to help us out with the uh, display issue. Um, so if you have any questions, please type them into the chat window or the Q&A window. 
and uh, Cameron will get to them as he uh, as he has time. Yeah, thank you. Um, any questions up to this point uh, on the demonstration and kind of what you've seen here today? Um, is this something that's useful for you all? And then once the application is, is restaged and redeployed, I can actually, it creates a route. Um, a dynamic route. So I can open that route up and there's my 12 factor application running. Um, this is all the 12 factor app is. Um, and here's the random route that it created. Um, it basically used the application name and uh, my namespace name. Um, and then tied that in that random route into uh, the uh, the SUSE dev environment environment, <clears throat> um, and you can see those routes within the console as well. Um, so if you go to routes, you'll see that route here that's created. So every application that has a random route that's created or any type of route, um, you can actually um, see those listed here. Um, and the log stream is available, um, you know, throughout this environment. So you can grab, uh, it's basically just a fire hose of events um, throughout the, uh, the application stack. Um, so this is specifically, this log stream is specifically for the application 12 factor. But if I wanted to take a look at, um, there's the services tied to the 12 factor app which is the Redis um, and any of the variables that are plugged in, in particular for this application, you can visualize those. You'll notice all the uh, um, password information and keys and all that stuff. That's all through this variables. Um, this <clears throat> events, so events over time, like it's going to log all these events over time. So you can get a historical view of what's going on with this particular application. I could set up a, a scaling policy to scale up the application based on certain events, uh, whether it's uh, resource type events uh, like CPU utilization and networking um, or um, memory constraints, various things of that nature. Um, if I wanted to take a look at Cloud Foundry as a whole uh, from the Cloud Foundry cluster, I could go into that cluster and take a look at um, the logging here as well. Um, I can look at the events across the cluster. I can look at uh, the quotas uh, for each one of the uh, various organizations. So I have a sandbox organization. You can see the quota limits for that particular uh, sandbox organization. You could have multiple organizations set up. So it gives you a level of multi-tenancy. So if you're looking for a type of tenancy-based uh, quota arrangement on top of Kubernetes, uh, this will provide that for you um, with organizations and namespaces. Um, you know, and applying quotas uh, to those. Here's the, the organization security groups, um, all the build packs that are available for it. Um, and here's the organizations that you can drill down into and all the spaces that are tied to that organization, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> any other questions? Anybody else have questions? Let's go we have about five minutes remaining, so if there are no questions, um, feel yeah. free to use the rest of the time for uh, general discussions or any other comments that you would like to make. Very well. I don't have any more stuff to show you. Um, 
And then maybe I will show you, this is the on-prem environment, um, but these feature flags have to be enabled in, in order for you to see some of these things, like the fire hose. Um, if I wanted to see all of my logging throughout the entire cluster, I can also disable some of these metrics. Um, and I, if I want to just show errors or if I just want to show logs from the applications uh, across the cluster, then I can just show those. Otherwise, these counters and metrics are just going to be scrolling quite fast. Um, most of that you're not going to understand unless you're doing some debugging of your application. Um, <clears throat> and of course, if you have admin rights, you can see things like users and, and uh, various other features within, um, within the Cloud Foundry environment. We do have a question in the Q&A window, um, probably yeah. the last one we have time for. Okay. Uh, can Cloud Foundry be deployed in a container? Can Cloud Foundry be deployed in a container? In a single yeah, in container, no. Now. Um, now, of course, there are ways of, um, in, in our current deployment, uh, yesterday version 2.1 came out and it is, it is slick. Um, I was able to install it in about 12 minutes. Um, so you can have a full Cloud Foundry environment, a default setup in 12 minutes running on top of Kubernetes. Um, that's pretty fast. It used to take about 25 minutes to a half an hour. Um, and so 12 minutes is quick. Um, it has, um, there's probably more than two dozen, uh, maybe three dozen containers um, because there are a lot of components working together. So putting it into a single container, that's not going to work with uh, the Cloud Foundry environment. 